Welcome to Reason and Theology, a show dedicated to apologetics, discussions, interviews, debates, and more. The hosts are Catholic, but also welcome charitable conversations with Orthodox, Protestants, and non-Christians. And welcome to the Reason and Theology show. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, on a Thursday evening, asking the question, is theology still the queen of sciences? What is metaphysics? Has science replaced theology? And much more. Today, joined by co-host Eric Ibarra and also Dr. Nicholas Didonato. How are you, Dr. Nicholas? I'm well. How are you? Doing great. Dr. Nicholas is an Eastern Orthodox, and he also teaches theology at the history, I'm sorry, and the history at Delaware Valley uh, Classical School and is a PhD in religious and theological studies, specializing in science, philosophy, and religion. So this is a unique, unique perspective that you're coming from. Uh, you're Eastern Orthodox, but you're an expert in science, philosophy, and religion. Wow. <laughs> Very nuanced. I like that. That's, that's great. Yeah, I, I love interdisciplinary work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Th this is exciting. So, you know, today we're talking about science and metaphysics, as I, you know, in indicated there in the intro. Um, a lot of ways in which we could go at this, but let me maybe just start it out by asking you this. Uh, just some basic questions. First of all, what is metaphysics for those of us who aren't familiar with the term? Great. Metaphysics is simply the philosophy of what is real, what actually exists. So, for example, if I go and I see a shadow on my table right here, am I going to say that's just really there, maybe causing the light, or does the light really cause the shadow? I need to distinguish what is actually real from what only maybe seems to be real or what's epiphenomenal, which has secondary reality, etc. I need to know what's actually real. That's metaphysics. And so for those who say, oh, we don't need metaphysics, I have to say, so we don't need things that are real. We don't need to say this really is real. This is not equally real. Uh, so for those who deny any need for metaphysics, it's very hard to see how they get off the ground living, actually, because I need to know what's real. At least I do. I don't know about you. I like yeah. to know what's real. Sure. Now, do things like cause the idea of causality, does that fall under metaphysics or science? Well, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> yeah. So the answer, I think, has to be both. So mm -hmm. you have to establish, first of all, metaphysically, what allows for causation. Because mm -hmm. you don't want to, for example, fall into Hume's famous trap. As Hume argued that there really isn't any such thing as causality, because all I have is a series of sequences. So, for example, if I go and I throw a rock into a window, now, I could try to argue that really the rock caused the window, but he would say, oh, no, all you have is frame one, the rock moves, frame two, the rock moves a little more, frame three, and then lo and behold, the rock shatters the window at some point. You see that frame. But how do I establish the causality of that? Hume argues you actually, in fact, can't. You could argue that there's sequences of things, but you can't ever argue that there's sort of hard causality. That, that's one of his critiques. And, and it's one of the ways metaphysics helps God around, at least classically, like in, in the classical tradition, was to say that there's formal causation, that when we see objects, that they have substances to them, they have form to them, and this form doesn't change. And so things are grounded metaphysically, and that allows for you to say, okay, it's not just what I'm observing, a rock go through the window. I have one radically unique object crashing into another radically unique object, all particulars, I could actually reason in terms of universals. And that helps me understand reality. Now, if you're stuck only with particulars, if you're a nominalist and you think all things are only unique, there are no universals, Hume presents, I think, a quite interesting problem for you. It's very difficult to get around Hume's critique of causation, for instance, since you brought that up, uh, without appealing to something else. Explain to me Hume's critique of causation a, a little bit, uh, a little bit more in, in depth. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with it, but I, I'm still not, you know, 100% up to par in uh, understanding it. So I want to make sure that I understand it. It seems like he's saying that we can't really know um, about causation because everything that we know is really just from our senses and we can't actually sense causation. That's the way I understand them. Am I way off base on that? No, that, that's basically right. Because um, to maybe we could uh, pick it back this off mm -hmm. his, his, his critique of, of induction as well, since I think the two are correlated, at least are treated very closely in, in his treat, um, 
inquiry of human understanding. Mm -hmm. So human reasoning, if I, let me try to phrase this way, I only am given particulars. So I have to argue that X causes Y. Well, okay, well, how do I do that? I could say, well, I throw a rock through a window one time. I throw it through a window again. I throw it through a window again. And every single time I throw it through a window. Okay, how do I know the rock is going to continue to break windows? Well, mm -hmm. Hume says, you think that because you're assuming that past experiences right. are going to adequately predict future ones. How mm -hmm. do you know that? This in philosophy of science is called the problem of induction. How do I know that past things are going to accurately predict future ones? But, but isn't this exactly what the scientific method is based on? I mean, we, we, we yeah. put things in a lab and we just kind of experiment with, with it. We see, okay, there's a correlation between, you know, if I do this, this happens. So it really seems like this is causing this. Um, does that maybe present a problem for science in general? Th Hume's that's prediction? exactly correct. Yes. And lots of philosophers of science spent a lot of trying, try, time trying to defend that. So, for example, Karl Popper. Karl Popper said, well, this induction is a huge problem. Let me try to do science without any appeal to induction. Let me try to do science purely deductively. And if I can do that, I can avoid Hume's problem because as far as Popper saw it, Hume is irrefutable. If you're going down Hume's path, you're not going to be able to defeat his uh, problem of induction for the simple fact that in induction, you always are going to have premises that are weaker than their conclusions. Right, because any particular statement of a rock through, uh, flew through a window and broke it is going to be weaker than the universal statement of rocks always break windows. So what's the problem with Hume? Why was he wrong? Well, I was, well uh, the way, well, I have to say how to break this down. So I would say Hume, I would actually defend Hume and say, if you are working in a nominalist worldview, if you're mm -hmm. limiting yourself to induction, if you're denying formal and final causality, Hume, I think, presents quite the challenge. Mm -hmm. So I actually think at the end of the day, Hume is quite formidable. Now, let me tell you what Popper, how Popper tried to refute Hume and why this didn't really pan out um, as quickly as I can, I, I suppose. Sure. So what Popper said, Popper came out the idea with, with falsificationism. He said the reason why science doesn't really need um, induction at all is really what it needs. It just needs a statement, a universal statement. Like I start with rocks break windows. And then all I need then is to find one observation that defies that. And I know my statement's wrong. Let's say I have like unshatterable bulletproof glass or something. And mm. now I know my statement's wrong. So his idea was that let me just make broad uh, hypotheses, it's broad hypotheses, and then let people try to knock them down. Mm -hmm. And if they can't, he would say my theory is corroborated, never verified, never proven, but corroborated. Mm -hmm. So that's how he tried to do like, So science loses out the ability to actually ever pr prove anything in any substantial way. Um, and I should note that even the early modern period, this point was conceived by people like Bacon. Right? This is why Bacon needs a new organon, right? Because Aristotle's organon logic isn't going to work because Aristotle demands deduction, right? Syllogism. Mm -hmm. He has high standards for rationality, which the early modern natural philosophers couldn't meet. So mm -hmm. Bacon says, the heck with this, right? I'm not going to do this. Uh, I'm going to say, what is a new organon? I want new discoveries and new powers over nature. If I could have lots of power over nature and new discoveries, that's what human rationality should be about. So mm -hmm. that's, it's just, I just think it's interesting. In the early modern period, it's actually you have the Aristotelians and the Catholics saying, we need high standards of rationality. And the early, you know, modern natural philosophers saying, no, we don't. That's all old fashioned. Who needs that? We need discoveries and powers, things that are able to be replicated and publicly shown. That's what we need. I don't want your fuddy duddy logic. So, anyway, so getting, getting back to, to Popper then. So, mm -hmm. Popper says, I have falsification, science just needs deduction, though I think a lot of philosophers of science, I would call it abduction, but so I, I have this way around it. The problem, unfortunately, for Popper is actual history of science. So let me just do like a famous example from um, the, a philosopher of science, Imre Lakatos. So Lakatos said, well, look, you give, uh, you tell a Newtonian, hey, by the way, Newton, your theory that's supposed to predict the orbit of Mercury is way off. 
the Utonian says, oh, well, I guess I'm just wrong. My theories been falsified. Better scrap the book, right, <laughs> and start over again. Of course not. No one thinks like that, right? He says, well, you know, maybe there's some unseen planet that's maybe blocking or, or creating a gravitational pull on Mercury. And you go, you don't find the planet. Okay, maybe there's a dust cloud that blocks the visibility of that unseen planet. And of course, as Lakatos rightly says, if anyone found this unseen planet, it'd be hailed as a victory of Newton. Look how brilliant Newtonian physics were. Because we, we saw this predation of Mercury's orbit and we thought to be a planet and lo and behold, there was. But alas, no plans found. But so Lakatos's whole point is that scientific theories are robust enough to resist the kind of falsification Popper proposed. That's just not, this is not true to actual history of science. Because through every single scientific theory, there have always been challenges to it, parts they couldn't quite explain. Nowadays, there's been the problem of oh, how many decades now of quantum gravity. There are mm -hmm. contradictory uh, theories of how gravity works at the quantum level. Or the issue of quantum entanglement, right? Things appear to go faster than the speed of light. That should not be possible. So, so there are always, always problems with scientific theories. To my knowledge, at least, and I'm not really a historian of science per se, but to my knowledge, at least, there's never been a scientific theory so bulletproof it never encountered any kind of problems it could not solve. It right. was just, you know, smooth sailing the whole way. So that's why Popper has problems, because he has sort of this really idealized, not really true to actual scientific practice view of science. That's not actually how, actually how science works. I hope I answered your question. Sorry, I, I spoke yeah, longer than and, I intended. And you also, you brought up Aristotle there. Um, and that, that's kind of the, where I wanted to go next. Can you maybe yeah. answer the question? Because we hear it all the time that <clears throat> science has somehow, um, made Aristotelian metaphysics, you know, irrelevant. Um, yeah. it's entirely outdated now because of science. What do you think about that? Well, I would say anyone with interest in that question should read uh, Edward Fazer's excellent book on this called <laughs> Aristotle's Revenge. He right. systematically goes through that. Um, I, I can minus the parts where I don't think he, he get, treats Plato fairly. Other mm -hmm. than that, I can really heartily recommend the book. Um, so if you want like a really comprehensive, detailed answer, I, I would go to him. Uh, mm -hmm. To answer your question, though, it's like a, a, I was saying before that Science can't get rid of metaphysics. I mean, mm -hmm. to, to use one of Fazer's favorite examples, right? Change. The mm -hmm. Aristotelian assertion that change is real. Mm -hmm. Well, what scientific experiment can prove or disprove that change is real since experiments by definition presuppose change? All right. Yeah. So it just make it just doesn't make a lot of sense. How can a scientific experiment show there's no such thing as potential being? Yeah. I, I how would such you have to assume these exist? things right either has to assume it or at least you could say if you don't like aristotle or the neoplatonists who also affirm potential being if you don't like that you could say what's well, just not relevant but you can't say that science disproves it that, oh, yeah. that's just an odd thing it's just a, a categorical mistake a very odd thing to say now we we i you know i at least i would think that we through sensation experience change i know there's some critiques there but just just saying the yeah. way it seems it seems like there's change when i observe the world through my senses and uh is that uh, maybe gratuitous on my part a am i am i reaching or are my senses reliable and there really is change you know what I'm, what i'm experiencing really is there i'm sorry i, I missed the yeah the what i'm part of your question yeah uh, yeah really is you know, is this uh, experience that I have of change, or at least it seems like there's change in the world uh, through my senses, is that a reliable um, assumption? Or should we say maybe that my senses are not reliable and what seems like there's change in the world, maybe my senses are deceiving me uh, and there really isn't change there. Does that make sense? I hope I it does. <laughs> yeah. So the only thing I would note with that is either mm -hmm. way, you're making a metaphysical assumption. So are the okay. senses reliable? That's the metaphysical question for the same reason. You can't do a scientific experiment to show whether the senses are reliable because yeah. that requires the senses. You right. can't <laughs> do an experiment without it the senses. It assumes it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in terms of whether the senses are really reliable or whether yeah. we're brains and vats or the Cartesian problem, that honestly requires a specialist. I mean, I don't have necessarily a subject I say in the kind of detail to give you a good answer for that. 
I always um, thought I personally that. think the senses are reliable. Yeah. But if you look, press me on that, I could not really defend that statement too well, I don't think. Here's my layman's way of, of proving it. Because, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. you know, anybody who says, okay, the senses aren't reliable, you don't really know what's what's going on in the objective world out there, you know, your senses could be deceiving you. I've always said, okay, well, let me just punch you, knock you out, take your wallet. And then as soon as I take your money, you're, you're going to come up to me and say, hey, you know, where's my money? I want my money back. What you did was wrong. What are you talking about? This never happened. Well, oh, well, you punch. Me. But that's based on your senses and your senses. Aren't really, nobody functions in this world that's right. that's with right. the idea in real life. Nobody functions with the idea right. that my senses aren't reliable. You would say that that's absurd. Of course, you punched me and you took my money and that's wrong. And I'm suing, you know, right, we right. assume at that point that our senses are reliable when it impacts our lives. So nobody practically lives like that. I mean, when we cross the street, we look both ways. Nobody says there's not really a truck coming. My senses are lying to me. Nobody actually lives that way. So that's my shortcut layman's way of sure. just saying, I think that that's a ridiculous, um, you know, claim that some people make when they say that the senses are unreliable. And it's well, important yeah. to say that they are reliable because it seems like a lot of metaphysical and philosophical uh, proofs for the existence of God are, are first based on the senses. They're based on sense experience. And then we move from the senses and go to other things. So if we throw away the senses, okay, yeah, we we've thrown, we, we've taken away the force from some of these philosophical proofs for God, but who actually lives like that? That's right. Does that That's make it. sense? You know, that does. And, and even human admits that he doesn't, he himself doesn't live like a skeptic. He has to make right. sort of common sense, you know, <laughs> assumptions like that. Uh, the only thing I would really say, though, is it doesn't get out of the brain in a vat argument where yeah. your brain in a vat and your entire sense for, uh, data is just false. So, yeah, you're right. Someone goes and punches you, but that didn't happen any kind of objective reality, maybe like a computer uh, simulation or something. So you experience that, but that's not what's going on in reality. You're kind of being deceived in, in these sensations. And also, I would say even probably better than that is the Nietzschean argument. So Nietzsche could say, you know, my, my favorite quotes from him is uh, man's truths are his irrefutable errors. You know, he would say that, OK, yeah, you know, someone did go and they punch you. But are you really understanding truths about objective reality or truths for survival? You're humanizing the experience because you feel victimized and someone took your money. Well, you know, things like possessions, things like your feelings and your pain, that's all you humanizing a world that's other, otherwise irrational. So I think Nietzsche also could really, you know, cut, cut, you know, make some good mm -hmm. objections there. Okay, so you, you've given a few, you know, points for why metaphysics are, you know, is still important and is not irrelevant and outdated, you know, based on science now. Um, but why would you say it's the queen of science? Yeah. Right. Well, I say it's the queen of the sciences. Yeah. Well, actually, I would argue that theology is the queen of the science. Right. Yeah. Why Why so, is, is theology the queen of the sciences? Great. Um, mm -hmm. So first, it requires that middle step of metaphysics establishing science. So once we agree that, agree that the natural world needs some basic metaphysical assumptions, like we're saying, like mm -hmm. the senses are reliable, which, again, I personally agree, just for clarification, right? I do actually believe the senses are reliable, sure. right? So that change is real, that causation is real, right? And maybe we can even throw in fun things like nature is simple. Is it really simple? I don't know, but that makes for good scientific method, right? Or things like the language of nature is mathematics. Is it really I don't know, but again, that seems pretty useful at least. Anyway, so making even, you know, these kind of metaphysical assumptions, great. So once you've established that, great, here are sort of the metaphysical foundations that I need to get science up and running. Fantastic. So now where does theology come in? Well, I would argue, and this is where I sort of betray my love for uh, St. Dionysius the Areopagite here, mm -hmm. is that theology handles that which is beyond or before being that which transcends being, which is utterly ineffable. So we have a being, pre presumably, right? We re-enter as being, that's a science is studying, assuming studying things that exist, I would hope. So has being, and then theology says, okay, whence being? How do we explain being? Hence it appeals, at least in the Neoplatonic tradition, again, think Gregory of Nyssa, 
Saint again Dionysius, Maximus the Confessor, etc. What is uh, beyond being, and that's going to ground metaphysics. And so ultimately, any kind of reference in reality is going to point all the way back to theology. And honestly, as there's a favorite topic of this show, it gets back to the essence energies distinction. Right. Because you have yeah. something utterly in the, and again, this is in the, in the Neoplatonic tradition, truly ineffable, not like subsistent existence itself or ipsum esse, like, like in a Thomistic tradition, you know, truly ineffable. That's only then manifests himself through uh, his activities, such as the divine names. So that so all I have to say is theology then grounds all the reality. And you know, it's like I try to press to my students, theology is about what's ultimately real. This isn't like some, you know, all academic pie in a pie stuff. We want to know everyday living, what is real? Are things like evil real? Is the world really good? You know, these are sort of the heart of the questions here. And so I would argue that, you know, metaphysics is necessary for science it grounds science and just as metaphysics grounds science so too does theology then ground metaphysics it grounds being beyond which is by definition uh, unintelligible it's ineffable you cannot it cannot be comprehended help me understand that because you know we we hear in uh pseudo dionysius that um god is beyond being yes you know super essential um Help me with that. I understand that somebody who says that is is basically saying, you know, God is not uh, being in the way that we're being. But it sure sounds like one is saying that he's not being at all. And if he's not being at all, it just sounds like, OK, then he doesn't exist. How can you say that this thing exists when it doesn't have any being? Like, help me with this. That's right. That's right. So. So first part, one is that being is a divine name. So, okay. so being is one of the ways which God is present in the world through being. But the point in the Neoplatonic tradition is that that's not all God is. God isn't mm -hmm. fully captured by this one divine name being. So that's part of it. But there are I can't say things, right? Because of things must be beings, right? right? But there's that which transcends even being. And you're saying, well, how could that be? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple places where the Neoplatonists are getting this from. Uh, the first, well, I guess, yeah, basically the first would be Plato's Republic. So in the Republic, you have the, the, the famous divided line. And basically, long story short, so it might take me a while to explain all that. Uh, basically, long story short, he says that just as the sun provides visible light to shed light on visible things so that they become visible to the eyes, so too the good transcends even being. This is a very famous part in the, in the sixth book of the Republic. Transcends even being. And so being becomes intelligible to intellects. And so the Neoplatonists interpret this as good must transcend being. Good, the good itself is beyond being because being presupposes good. Being itself has preconditions, in other words. Being just can't be totally, uh, ironically, subsistent, right? But actually has preconditions such as goodness. Now, again, why would Plato say this? Because if you look at any being to make it intelligible, to understand it, you need to know what's good about it. That's how you understand being. That's what illumines being. So whether like this computer, right? We're on a computer program right now. We know what makes that good, and that's what gives it intelligibility. It illumines being. So without goodness, there could not be being. Being would be just utterly unillumined. Well, what's good now, about a computer? Help me. Well, so about a computer, well, for one thing, and in this case, um, my internet hasn't died. I think that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> right, it's functioning, right? So we have, we have right. you know, certain ends, right, telly, that, that the computers are oriented towards. Okay. So it's the extent that it fulfills its telos, okay. it is good. And that sense. illumines what the thing is. If I don't have that, I don't know what's good about it. And like a, you know, to use an older analogy, a VCR machine yes. or whatever. Yes. Uh, if, if it doesn't play the VCR tape, it's not good. It's good if it plays it. The same, I guess, for a DVD player. Even those are outdated now. That's right. <laughs> we just live stream everything at this point. So. Right. But is that basically what you're saying? If it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It's exactly. And that requires something beyond being because anything that's supposed to has to be beyond the realm of being because it's normative, right? The good is normative, has to transcend anything that is. Mm -hmm. So 
Now, for another argument, on centuries later, Plotinus, right, the father of at least pagan Neoplatonism, he argues that anything to be must be one. That beings always presuppose a principle of unity. You can't have a being as not also one. And he applies this even to being itself. This is why he puts the one even beyond being explicitly, because even being itself requires unity. Otherwise, it wouldn't be being itself, it wouldn't be anything. So again, this is another precondition for being. Being presupposes goodness, being pre uh, presupposes unity, and to maybe aggravate the Thomists a little bit, this is where uh, St. Dionysius would come in and say also, because in, in the chapter four, what he's talking about what's before being, which is, which is goodness, he equates goodness with beauty as well as love. So he's a very, very so for, for St. Dionysius, he would say even beauty is sort of a prerequisite of being, as is love, both agape and eros. These are both before being, beyond being. So you asked me what's before being and beyond being, hopefully I gave you sufficient examples from various um, Neoplatonic texts about that. You know, Aquinas deals a lot with uh, Dionysius. What, what does he do when there's points of divergence? I mean, how does he, yes. how does yes. he handle that? Uh, yes, I mean, I He's this. respectful to tradition, so what, what is, he's not just going to say, well, you know, who cares what Dionysius says? Absolutely. So. Absolutely, you're absolutely correct. So uh, he's actually, so uh, St. Dionysius, actually, the people don't realize this, the most cited Christian in the Summa Theologica, more than St. Augustine, actually. So people don't realize how frequently St. Dionysius is in uh, Thomas's works. So yes, Thomas does respond to this. And his response is basically, well, when Dionysius spent this, he meant goodness and referred to cause, but you can't have cause without being. So really being is truly prior to goodness because again, goodness is more like an adjective, right? We're saying the cause is good, but something has to be doing the causing and that is being. Okay, right? what's hence, wrong with that? Hmm? Yeah, what's, what's wrong with that? Well, like I said, I, I, you know, I try to perhaps not well, <laughs> you know, give arguments of why being itself does have preconditions such as goodness from Plato's Republic, you know, unity, uh, from Plotinus's work, you know, so I, and I so and, and in Thomas Aquinas' defense, we have to remember that he's writing in the 12th century. In mm -hmm. the 12th century, they at most had fragments of the Timaeus, the Phaedo, and the Mino, at most, right? So the most they would have had in the Latin West, because I have to remember that the, the Latins are getting their Platonic, they're getting their Greek works, I should say, from the Muslims. Mm -hmm. And for reasons that I don't know, because that's my specialty, the Muslims didn't really care for Plato. I think a lot of their works didn't even bother translating from the Greek. Mm -hmm. So this is why when Averroes translates all this stuff into Latin for the for the scholastics, the West the Western scholastics, it's all Aristotle. Hardly any Plato. Because the Muslims didn't translate him into into um what is it Arabic or Aramaic? I'm sorry, I forget which one in the first place. Yeah. So uh, that would be why. So all, all I have to say is, I think if Thomas Aquinas had read the Republic, for instance, if he had access to that work and could see how the good illumines being, he might have had a different take. But I think his response to Dionysius is just to say, this doesn't make any sense, right? How mm -hmm. do you have something beyond being? That can't, mm -hmm. you know, something must be just some mystical whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. I don't know. Because he didn't have Plato's Republic. He didn't have Plotinus' work. I don't, I don't think he had Proclus' work. You, you get the idea. Sure. Um, I, I will say, though, uh, in defense of Thomas Aquinas, uh, is that, you know, towards the end of his life, he basically says my works are like nothing, you know. Yeah. So I, I really do think he had a, you know, a, a real experience of God yeah. to realize that there is something tr transcendent going on here beyond the realm of right. being. Yeah, he had a mystical experience and basically said, you know, everything he had written was, was garbage, um, effectively. So, yeah, I don't have the exact quote. I, I, mean, I apologize. Yeah, no, no, that, that's quote. not the exact quote. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's to it. that effect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I don't remember yeah. the exact quote. I, I do apologize for that. But yes, no, that, no, that, is, yeah. that is to the effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a lot more questions, but I want to pass it over to Eric, give him an opportunity to jump in here. What, what you got for us, Eric? Yeah, thank you, Michael. Nicholas, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, <clears throat> You've been uh, exhilarating here with all this uh, information. I, I didn't know what to expect. You know, we, we, I was just notified about this, you know, yesterday or today, I forget which. And, um, you know, I didn't know who you were. So uh, just before we popped on, on, on live here, I'm just filled with all kinds of questions that I could have written down from last night. No, if I would have known. But 
uh, yeah, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, um, he didn't even want to write anything after that. Um, and uh, in fact, he wasn't going to tell anybody about what happened until until he was pressured by one of his disciple monks. Um, what you know? Why won't he finish? Because he didn't finish the Summa. He, he was going to finish. I think uh, it was on penance. I, I think he was still working on it, and he didn't even want to finish because um, of that mystical experience. And uh, I think the only thing he ever did after that was write a commentary on the Song of Songs, and and that was it. <laughs> yeah. But um, you know, I I, I was going to go back to issues related to, to uh, natural science, but you you piqued my interest here with with Neoplatonism <laughs> and non-being. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, how do you predicate? this distinction between being and non-being when it comes to the Trinitarian relations. Um, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit under, okay, metaphor analogy alert across the board. Let me just put that asterisk down, okay? Um, how Do we put that under the category of being, like the Father as Father, the Son as Son, the Holy Spirit as Holy Spirit? Is that being coming from a larger uh, non-being ineffability? Or do you think that the Trinitarian relations are up there in that ineffable, unexplanatory, super essential nothing, um, and then everything out that comes out of it is being? Yeah, so if I understood your question correctly, you're asking, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Okay. Are the relations of the Trinity Right. The, the um, yeah. Are they beyond being or are they within the realm of being? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So like so like, you know, Palamas, Maximus, yes. Gregory, all of them, they talk about God. Right. But there's different ways they speak of God. God can be energetically. God can be essentially. God can be, you know, in these ways. God essentially is basically what Dionysius means when, you know, super essential being, which is non-being. But um, the sun as sun. So if we just think of the sun as the sun, his, 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 yeah, I don't, I want to say existence, but then I'm going right back into uh, being category. Um, you know, I bring this up because I have a friend of mine who, who's been deeply influenced by Neoplatonic literature by like Eric Pearl yeah. Yeah. and, uh, you know, some of these other uh, yeah. scholars that have, uh, picked up on what seems to be, you know, pretty common knowledge that Dionysius was Neoplatonic. <laughs> yes. and that, that gets carried up through the Eastern posture of writing on, on this. Um, and he, he seems to say that the Trinity is under the category of being and that the one, which can't be three, is only that which is and non-being. So I, I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Or, at, at yes, all. I, I have, uh, I guess, two two replies. One is that in, in chapter four of the divine names, I think he explicitly says that goodness encompasses both being and non-being. So it's not, so when he's saying God is beyond being, he means just that. I don't think he means that God is non-being. God is that which encompasses as good, right? God as the divine name good, qua good, is that which encompasses and transcends both being and non-being as sort of their common source, I guess is the best word for it, our key, right? Right. So now for the question of the, so, so I'm not sure, I'll just be careful personally, and maybe, maybe you're correct, I'd have to look at it more closely, whether it's fair to say that beyond being is equivalent to non-being. I think that's, that guy could be, that right. could be yeah. tricky. Yeah, I, I, I guess what I meant was when we say like non-existence or non-being, um, it, it, what I what we just mean is that it's it, it's not something within that. It, it's something. It, it's not something that it, being itself is. Um, it's not it, it, trying to put words to this. Um, non-being or non-existence doesn't mean like literally nothing. Right. Um, but it does mean that it's something beside it or something that explains it, but we can't explain that. Right. Yeah. And, and it, yeah, all I want to emphasize is that we're discussing 
God being beyond being as goodness or as or as beauty okay. and, and as in book for the divine names. We need something that's beyond being, not less than being, like you're saying, the source right. of being, something that that transcends it, not something that's less than being, which would be non-being or, or things like that. Uh, and yeah. to your other question, though, I think the answer is both and. Because in book two of the divine names, he seems to put the tr trinity in what's the ineffable. And in the, more importantly, I think in the mystical theology, the mystical theology begins along the lines of trinity beyond being, beyond this, beyond that. I believe it's like the very, very first line. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. You know, it's there in mystical theology, though. Even it's not the first line. You get the idea. So, yeah. so I would say he explicitly does put the trinity beyond being, but at the same time, being a, a good Neoplatonist, I think he would say that God as father is also father in being. So, for example, uh, I'm a father, and we tend to think of, well, I'm a father. And so when I think God is father, I'm using my human terms to impose it on God. Now, if we're talking about God qua being, right, not qua God qua ineffable, but God qua being, it would be then the opposite, that God as father is the measure of my fatherhood. God as son is the measure of my sonhood. So God sets the standard. God is the measure of being. And you'll find that throughout the Neoplatonic literature. Plotinus, Theo Dionysius, God is the measure of being. And so I would say, yeah, so the Trinity, those Trinitarian relations are there in being, right? So it's both and. They're both beyond being, as I think is clear in the mystical theology. And they're also in being as the very measure of being. Yeah, so I guess what you're saying is that... Um you know, in the ineffable, you still have that complexity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in, you know, qua being, it's measurable to what we're discerning by names. Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I, I hate to go into this direction. Tell me if you if you get annoyed with this. But do you think that Plotinus could come along and say, hey, you know, I understand that you got the point about the one and you know the 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 ineffable but you've got a complexity there father son and holy spirit so how does that work with the absolute the the nest then the, the, you know the, how can those three i mean in other words the one oh he, he feels his conception is kind of like well how can you have now father Son, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the Christian modification of the divine simplicity that we get in uh, in the in the debates of the second, third, and fourth century. Um, what would you say about that? Where if he would say, you know, if he came along and said, but you still have metaphysical complexity there in uh, in the ineffable. Yeah, well, I would say just that it, it's ineffable, right? So that's why I think it works as such a great defense of the Trinity, because. I'm not saying I'm going to make intelligible, I'm going to find some weird wonky way to make, you know, one plus one plus one equal one. I'm not doing that. I'm explicitly admitting to you, it's unintelligible by definition, right? Because to be is to be intelligible. And I'm talking that which is beyond being, and therefore that which is beyond intelligibility. So I'm admitting from the gut go, you're not going to understand it. But I'm not doing this in some kind of like lazy, you know what, I'm running out of time, let's just say inexplicable, right? I'm not doing that. I think there are good metaphysical reasons to put God beyond being. But if I put God beyond being, I'm admitting that he's going to be ineffable and unintelligible. And again, this is why the essence energy distinction is so important in the East because you need to preserve God's ineffability and yet still have some way to interact with God as uncreated, as truly God. So that's a bit, I don't think, I don't know. Does he explicitly critique the Trinity? You know, I have to oh, check no, and see no, whether no. Plotinus yeah, actually no. does explicitly critique the Trinity. I don't know. But I, I would say the response is we're talking about the ineffable. I mean, it's no less than call God the one, right? Because even he explicitly says, Plotinus himself says, the one is just a placeholder. Ignore it, get past it. God's ineffable. Plotinus is not in any way dogmatic about you must call God the one. He says, get rid of it once you're done with it. I get the exact quote for you if you want. I don't, I don't remember the top of my head. I want to say- No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I just, you know, it, the, it, my limited reading, it, you know, it seems like they, they got to this ineffable speak because of the, the need for an absolute, uh, an, uh, an explanation stopping point where things are just 
no longer need to be explained anymore. Yes. Um, and it was always a, my understanding that it was the singularity of it that, you know, the simplicity, absolute divine simplicity. Um, you know, once they, that was really what made for an explanation stopper was there's no complexity beyond this. I think that's true of the Thomistic tradition. I really don't find that in the Neoplatonic tradition. Cerna and Plotinus, like I said, he explicitly denies that. He doesn't, to my knowledge at least, ever say it's really about simplicity. Like I said, he explicitly denies that. He says the ones even beyond that is the same with Stilo Dionysius, Proclus. Again, I really think that's true for the Thomistic tradition, that you have this absolute simplicity as, as a, a stopping point. But for the, the, the more Eastern tradition, the Aplonk, of the Neoplatonic tradition, it's the ineffability of God. Because you're going to reach something, you're going to at some point reach something which is unintelligible, which huh. is beyond being unintelligible. Yeah. And that's where you're going to encounter God. And this is why there's such a focus, certainly in the Catholic West. I, I no mean, mean to disparage the tradition of, of the Catholic West, but certainly East as well, emphasis on prayer, right? This is why the number one tool of the theologian is prayer and seeking virtue. Because only in prayer can we truly contemplate God, who is right. beyond being unintelligible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just, um, I always thought that the undifferentiatedness of the ineffable is what explain, and it, from as best as possible, uh, defines that ineffability, which can't be done, right? Um, but in other words, differ, differentiatedness is something in being and so by by consequence or by 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 distinction the ineffable is also something that can't be differentiated but i could have that wrong so so what you're saying is in the neoplatonic tradition the ineffable is neither complex or simple it's just no, there's nothing else that could be said about it. It's beyond. Yes, it's beyond. It's truly ineffable. Because I, I think what they would say, or what you're saying, is that you, we keep telling you that God is ineffable and beyond being, and you keep trying to make God a being. You keep trying to say, no, here are the boundaries. I have, the, I have this idea here. It's perfectly intelligible, but that's being explicitly denied. But the recovery point is, again, the essence energy is distinction, or the divine names, right? We have divine names, right? Or, or the the participations, right, in Parkless's pagan philosophy, right, the participations, there's ways in which God makes himself known, right, as oneness, right, as oneness, saveness, difference, being, right, truth, all these things, all these things are how God makes himself known. So what you're saying, like I said, so I think, the, I think there's just virtually almost no disagreement here, because everything you're saying can be affirmed in the Abraham tradition, they would just take it one step even further and say, but God's beyond even that. I see. That's as you know, as Dionysius and Gregory Palamas say, you know, God is both beyond knowing and beyond unknowing. Right. So, yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, you know, going back to science and religion, um, I like what you were talking about because I, it's really important for people today to understand that you can't get science off the ground right. until you've employed metaphysics. And I, I think this is something that, Phaser brings out great, um, I know the, the ministry of Bishop Robert Barron uh, in the Catholic Church, he's really talking about confronting the new atheism and scientism. I'm sure you're familiar with these terms, scientism being that the, um, whether it's the only kind of knowledge that we can have or the only kind of knowledge that really has substance to it is that which can be empirically proven uh, with the controlled rep reproducibility and, and, and the measurable clarity and all that. So I think it's important, all the points that you made, that we're already making presuppositions, we're already invoking metaphysical, uh, unassumed regularity, that something that's true in part is going to be true in whole. So let's say somebody says, okay, that makes sense. I, I, I accept that. But the way human civilization has unfolded is when when people tend to start when people tend to stop appealing to the supernatural 
and start getting into this scientific research, however metaphysically um, dependent it is, uh, we end up advancing in ways that didn't happen when people were stuck on the appeal to supernatural. So when people started to say, well, I'm not going to appeal to the supernatural for this. Let me look at this through a scientific way. And then boom, there's this human advancement. And then all the way now to the, to the present day in the 21st century, um, we're bred from our, from the crib uh, in, in secular culture to look at the appeal to the supernatural as look that's primitive that's that's what kept people um behind if it you know look we have heart medication now that uh let's just say the primitive folks in the past would have never gotten to um because they were praying for it they were praying to live till 80 90 years old we don't need to pray anymore about this We've got the medicine for it, you know. I bring this up because you know Michael and I and some other folks have have always uh, we we hear certain objections from the Eastern Orthodox, and uh, one of the famous objections has been that uh, divine simplicity or the Hellenization of metaphysics uh, has led to atheism. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but. Um, you know, th that there's this belief. My personal belief is that some of the new technological and scientific advancements have people looking back at praying, the, the, pr the primitive people who prayed, they prayed for something that we've utilitar we have u u utilized um, and received through science. So how would you respond to somebody who says, and, and, and the basic question is, you know, put in short, Yes, I understand metaphysics is there's there's some dependence on metaphysics just to get science off the ground, but it doesn't really bring me to a personal God, you know, because it looks like human beings are the ones that are patching everything to make things better through science and through a denial of the supernatural. Yeah, I have. I'm trying to organize all my responses here because they're on several levels. <laughs> okay. so let me let me just get relax, me, relax. Get, just yeah, tell yeah. me what's on your yeah. mind. Sorry. <laughs> so maybe start with the historical. So one is since at least the pre-Socratics, people haven't been just saying, "Well, I guess the gods did it." Nothing else to investigate here. I mean, I think it's just a very poor history of science to say, you know, it was until a scientific revolution that we tried to find natural causes. That's just, again, I think it's a very hard history of science to actually maintain. I look at uh, David, I would, if everyone's interested, look at David Lindbergh's um, History Western Beginnings. I can't remember the, the exact title of the book. He'll go through this. He'll say, look, here's your pre-Socratic science. Is it we have no, did they just say, I guess the gods did it? No, of course not. Like that's just, that's, this is pre-Socratic times. So to say that, you know, the pillar of civilization is to not pray. Uh, and this has only been done recently with modern secularism. I just don't think that's gonna hold to be historically true. I also have a metaphysical problem with this. And that's mainly, well, what is natural? You say, I can't pillar with supernatural. What's supernatural? Because these aren't steady terms. These aren't consistent terms that have applied through all of history. You know, there was a period of time where pagans and Christians and Jews, et cetera, thought when you looked at the sky and saw the stars, you were seeing angelic beings. And so now are angels natural or supernatural? They're probably natural because you can see them with your eyes. They're right there. Are you blind? Right? I mean, so you could, you could just see them. So there's a problem here because people, I, I really think it's unfortunate that the naturalists have hijacked the term natural because what's in dispute is not what is natural so again here's another example uh does teleology or form count as a natural explanation or am i limited only to what the mechanical philosophers will allow me i have to explain everything like a mechanism everything has to have kinetic touching and movement and gears turning are forms supernatural well i think for a long period of time people said no they're part of reality they're just they're a natural part of reality in fact, one of the words 
that uh, is often translated form in Plato's work is the word for nature in Greek, physis, right? It's, just, it's actually a word, it's often translated as form. So I, I think it's just problem metaphysically. If you ask me, well, can I use a supernatural? I would just note that, well, what we consider supernatural now in the 21st century is not what would have been considered supernatural a thousand years ago. So do you mean modern distinctions as made by the naturalists or what, what do you mean? How are we determining what's even natural and supernatural? And that's a metaphysical question. So the whole thing presupposes has giant metaphysical assumption that it's kind of intuitive what's natural and what's supernatural. And I would, I would challenge that metaphysically, make sure we have our definition straight of what am I defining as natural, what am I defining as supernatural? And then there's just sort of, I guess, the, the practical point that you raised about prayer. So um, why do we pray? We could pray, certainly, and we should pray, you know, for, for divine healings and, and for miracles. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But is that really the main purpose of prayer? You know, uh, St. Dionysius, again, I, I told you, I quote him a lot. You know, in book three of the Divine Names, you know, he describes prayer as like a rope. So a rope is hooked to a rock, like it, I believe in the ocean, something like that. When you're pulling on the rope, you're not moving the rock. You're moving closer to the rock. That's what prayer is. Prayer moves us closer to God. Prayer is how we move close to God. And that's what I would think we should want prayer to be, to be close to God. I think that's more important than whatever medicine can, can give me, right? Yeah. What is, Christ himself says that. What is it good if you gain the whole cosmos, right? The entire universe, the entire ordered, created world, uh, but, lose, but lose your soul, lose your, lose your life. What, what good is that? So, so I think there's also a distortion of what prayer is. The, the competition shouldn't be between prayer versus medicine. That just seems like a very odd matchup to me. Prayer is about bringing us to God. Medicine is about healing the body. Now, can prayer miraculously end up healing the body? Sure, I'm not denying that. But I'm just saying that's not its primary purpose. I don't pray, I hope, primarily for health and wealth and I don't know, right. other, other such things. Am right. I answering your question? Sorry. So yeah, no, that, I, as you were speaking, several things are going through my mind. I hopefully I was able to. No, no. What I was thinking. Take it easy. Yeah, take, yeah, relax. We're Any content we can get out here, we want to. We, we all understand that as much as we interview our guests, we're really just scratching the surface of their thoughts on these things. Yeah. So don't, don't, don't uh, think that, um, you know, that you need to go on explaining. We understand. All right. My primary apologies. Yeah, no, yeah. I think it's important you bring out that whole, the the under, the purpose, right? The, the the why of a thing, because that's another thing that's been inverted is the, the purpose of human life. You know, I, I remember in my evangelical days, uh, I used to go door to door evangelizing. And, uh, and one of the questions we used to ask people right off the bat was, what do you think the purpose of life is? What's the meaning of life? And I tell you, you know, even Christians, people who are attending church, they still can't tell you what the meaning of life is. So, but I, I think the, I think my question is not so much that the, you know, those people were trying to uh, describe prayer as a health wealth mechanism or, a, you know, a machine or God's a machine to just, you know, hospitalize my body all the time. Um, but what I think some people might think today is, well, why is it that 700 years ago or 800 years ago, and I might be totally wrong on this, I might, they're, they're, watch, there's going to be some vegan that's going to correct me in the comments, but um, 800 years ago, 900 years ago, there were some, you know, maybe they were doing the whole unitive telos in prayer, but one of their prayers was to get over their sickness or get over their, their illness or um, God, please uh, help me in this journey from Egypt to, he you know, Hezbollah or, you know, on foot, you know, where today we wouldn't think we wouldn't blink at certain things like that. Like if we have a headache, we can get Tylenol off the shelf or um, if we want to go to Hezbollah from Egypt, we, you know, we, it's, it's very simple transport. Um, and, and so a modernist today is thinking, well, all those people were praying for these things, but we have it just within hands distance. And, and, and we got here, not through, um, 
you know, uh, interventional answers to prayer, but through from the ground up. You know, and this might mistake this whole issue because some people are not seeing God in the progress of humanity. That's that's one of the assumptions. So to keep that in mind. So yeah, that's the that's the objection that, that we're trying to answer here is that those people who look past look, look to the primitive times, and and they see how poorly people overcame human difficulties. Whereas today we overcome those human difficulties without having to pray, without having to do all these things. And so, you know, they can almost say, well, look at that. You know, um, we, they were, they were somehow disabled and now we are enabled through a natural scientific process. And so the objection is, why do I need prayer? Is, yeah, not- why, like if I don't, you know, if we didn't need a supernatural intervention that would just come from the sky, you know, like God, picture like a zipper opening up the blue sky, and God throwing down books on how to make medicine, and here's, you know, here's this new tile, you know, this I'm giving you Tylenol, and I'm giving you, you know, this medication to numb you, or this is you know, penicillin and morphine, these will all help you. Um, He didn't, that's not how it happened, right? So we came to the knowledge of morphine, we came to the knowledge of all these things through, um, and this is where I say, not the, not the denial, like the appeal to supernatural, that whole thing of the supernatural and the natural distinction being assumed, I get what you're saying. But what, what they would say is just the ordinary human being asking questions not looking for a heavenly angel to come in and just give it to him he human beings have slowly learned and 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 to to the point where today we're making so many advances at such rapid rates not through prayer not through the you know the church the synagogue the mosque but through just naturalism, you know, just looking at objects and the material and the empirical, how would we respond to that? I mean, I have some thoughts on how to respond to that, but maybe you could respond, you know, give your thoughts first. Yeah, so what I would say in addition to to what I said before is the reason we've been able to make such progress is because we've taken on a Baconian paradigm where the goal, again, in his new Argonon is to seek new discoveries and powers. We want what works, right? Science also is about what works. And that's great. I'm not in any way opposed to things working or anything like that, medicines, whatever it may be. I want medicines to work as well. But we also, I think, would want truth. The other things, you know, to life other than things working, having air conditioning and computers and and medicine. And so I guess maybe part of me thinks, I mean, I apologize. I guess not getting like the the cut, like the edge of this question. If I'm understanding it, it's saying, well, yeah, I got so, all this great stuff because of science. Um, is it a fair response then, or am I not under, understanding the question? Oh, saying, yeah, yeah, yes, you, you did, right. but there are other things that are going on, and, and the way science gets it isn't necessarily by uncovering truths about the world, but just by giving us better ways to manipulate the world, which can be very good. Right? I'm, not, I'm not saying that as a bad thing. But right, yeah. there's other things to do in life other than manipulate the world in a way that eases our comfort. Yeah. If, I mean, unless comfort is all you're after in life, I just want to have maximum comfort. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. Am I, missing no the I, yeah. I feel like I'm missing the question. I, I do. Oh no, no, no. That's okay. Um, yeah. So, like, you know, we've had, you know, we've had a uh, atheist contributor come on here, and they'll ask certain questions, and sometimes, uh, you know, they're they're looking at the utility of God, you know, why, what, why isn't God, you know, it, it, there's me and there's theism, you know, an atheist is speaking, right. And I, and I want to go from here to theism. A lot of atheists present it this way, bring me there. That's how they come to, that's how they come to the table. Um, and, you know, but they say that, but what they're looking at through history and human ad, 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 advancement and all these things is they're seeing natural inquiry being the, the, the impetus for human development, not 
not um, divine interventions. And I think, you know, one of the ways I guess you could respond to this is that, you know, absolutely. The first, the first thing you said was right on the nail, which is the, the questioner is not really understanding the purpose to human life, which is one of the reasons why theology precedes science, because we, how can you understand what's best for a human being um, if you don't even know what a human being is? And if you, you, the only way to know a human being, anthropology, is it's under the category, you know, it's under theology, the, the, the creator of, of the anthropos. Um, but uh, so one of the that, that, that first point you made was absolutely essential. You're not understanding the purpose of human life. It's not just to, it's not just to, uh, you know, get rid of your headache. The purpose of human life is to, is to, is to, uh, uh know, love and serve the creator. Um, so that's the first thing. The other thing I would say, and you tell me what you think about this is that God is, God has been pleased to allow human inquiry as the means <laughs> <laughs> um, to human development. Um, so it, it wasn't really all that pleasing to him to, you know, when he'd created Adam and Eve to also create a hospital right down the road so that whenever they get sick, <laughs> they can go to the hospital. Um, it was also part of his own pleasure to allow human inquiry to be the impetus. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I would just emphasize again that human luxury is not the end goal of life. There, there is real value in suffering. There's value undergoing trials. That's how we acquire virtue. You know, as I tell my students all the time, Hitler can ace an ethics test. It's not that hard, right? But are you actually honest? Are you actually loving? Are you actually humble and patient? How do I acquire these virtues? Well, even the, the pagan philosophers like Plato and Aristotle say, well, you have to do them. And that requires pushback, that requires difficulty, that requires trial. So if the atheist says, all I want in life is luxury and comfort, and the best way to get that is utilitarianism, I mean, they're not wrong. Utilitarianism is the best way to get those things. Uh, what I'm questioning is whether, well, A, utilitarianism is true, whether truth simply breaks down to what simply works, and we don't need to distinguish between what works and what is true, I think that's highly problematic. And, and also B, that that's really all we need in life is just to have lots of comfort and medicine and not really undergo any kind of discomfort. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, if I had time, and you know, I don't think we're gonna do have time, but I would have poked your head, your brain a little bit on, on evil and suffering, which you touched upon. But um, Michael, I'm, I'm done, I'm sorry for taking up uh, no, not a problem. That, that was good. I, I have a couple questions. Um, we'll do them quick because I want to get to some chat questions. So everybody go ahead and start sending uh, your chat questions. Make sure to send them to at Reason and Theology so that I can see them and spot them out to differentiate them from comments. Um, so here, here's one of my questions. Uh, kind of going back to the discussion y'all were having there earlier, uh, maybe briefly, can you tell me what's the best argument for saying that God is beyond being? Because I can not I can verify being. I mean, I can just touch that desk right there. There, I verified being. Um, <laughs> I can't verify something that's beyond being because – it's beyond being. How do we know that there is something beyond being? Great. So I, I think, like I said before, my probably my favorite argument is actually Plotinus's over Plato's, that anything to be must have unity. You can't even picture being itself without picturing it as being itself as one thing. So any kind of being, even being itself, presupposes unity. It must have unity. Otherwise, it could not be at all. Uh, though I also think, like I said, uh, Plato's argument is, is, is good as well, where being also presupposes the good. You need to have goodness for, for there to even be being, to illumine, what be, to, to illumine what being is. How can you have something that exists without knowing what's good? It cannot exist independent of what's good. Um, we could also get into uh, Dionysius's, you know, with, with beauty and agape and eros, but I think they're not really as argumentative. You asked for an argument. But I think arguments you get from Plato and Plotinus. I mean, it, you know, you're pointing to it sounds like transcendentals, um, but they're they're still kind of in the category of being. I mean, I know to to an extent what goodness is, what beauty is, 
I have no idea what non-being is. So um, how, how do those maybe point us to non-being? So do you mean non-being as nothing, which is not no. there, which should be below being, or do you mean uh, that which is beyond above, being? Above. Beyond being, yeah, above. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, how do they um, point us to what is beyond um, being? How, how do we conclude that God is this? Why can't I just say that God is just being as such? So, you know, God is being uh, simple, simple being. Oh, and that's I it. Yeah. And it stops there. And then there's there's no more not, you know, above beyond yeah. that. Well, I would say, well, unless you get around Plato, uh, Plato's argument for goodness being a prerequisite of being or Plotinus is the same for unity, then being is not self-sufficient. Right? We think of, of God, God has to be self-sufficient. God can't be dependent on anything else. So if I could show that the causal chain of dependencies goes beyond being, I've shown that being can't be your stopping point. And then but I you're, but you're Neopopop still pointing me to something that I understand. I thought that this idea of beyond being is something that just can't be articulated in any kind of way maybe i'm misunderstanding or ultimately i th i think that is correct this is the best i can articulate it right that's, that's what i have yeah. to do right that was the challenge the challenge yeah, is yeah. to articulate it <laughs> right um so i i did the best that i could yeah but i think if you try to think about a goodness that's beyond being or oneness that's beyond being this is part of the puzzle right of the parmenides mm -hmm. you know plato's dialogue of the parmenides is in fact, I would I would suggest quite difficult to grasp, if not by definition impossible, because we're talking about a goodness beyond being. I'm not talking about simple goodness. When we when we try to make sense of that, we of course understand goodness, like you said, as a transcendental, perhaps you know something I can understand. But what mm -hmm. I'm telling you, but see how this is actually beyond being. You can kind of put them together, but I I would press you that if you think about it, you realize this really is ineffable. Same thing mm -hmm. with unity, a unity beyond being. Again, I would suggest that that truly is ineffable. Though the words lead you, they point you in that direction. But okay. I don't think they could get you to the point where you're going to fully grok that. Yeah. Now, the other question was, um, you know, when we look at science today, it seems to reduce everything to materialism. Everything is just material. Um, what would you say to those who uh, actually believe that everything can re be reduced to matter? Um are there maybe any proofs that you would have for something that is above matter, maybe the soul or, or anything? Well, I think that, that would be highly controversial. So yeah. I, I would point to something that I think the opponent wouldn't want to refute, like, like rationality. Mm -hmm. Because rationality is not a bit of matter. Rationality isn't simply the brain or even the neocortex or something like that. Rationality is the way we understand the world. And so that doesn't seem to me in a straightforward way reducible to the material. And more problematically, if you just show me that rationality is nothing but mechanical processes in my brain, that means there is no rationality. You actually have mm. to press and say, well, I guess rationality doesn't exist after all. So to mm. be on the side of rationality is to be on the, the side of something that's beyond matter. And the same thing applies to wisdom, right? Other such things. Mm. Unless well, the person well, say wisdom's all an illusion. Which, oh, go ahead. Well, Maybe they would say rationality is just material. You know, there, there really is such a thing as rationality, but it's just all material in, in your mind, in, in, this, in this brain of yours. Well, I would press them how so, because if it's material, I could touch it. So mm -hmm. show me where I could touch the rationality part of my brain. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. as far as neuroscientists know, there's no rationality part of your brain. Oh, here's mm -hmm. the rationality part. That's not yeah. how the brain works. Yeah. So I press them. You really say it's material? Great. That means I can touch it by definition. So let me touch rationality. I'd love to do that. <laughs> I would too. <laughs> right? That'd be fun. It's obvious though that rationality yeah. by definition is the processing uh, of sense perception, right? This is the point uh, yeah. Plato makes uh, in the Theotetus room. Is it Theotetus or the Sophist? I forget. One of those dialogues, right? This is, Plato argues this. You well, can't if I. If I could touch it, maybe I could just grab some more, put some more in me. So right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> that will help me better. <laughs> I, I don't think someone who says that really thought through what what they're saying. You, right. you really think rationality is tangible? Yeah. Make it so, like you're saying. Right. I don't exactly, exactly right. If it's tangible, just give me some more. I would love some more. And then, lastly, what is your, in your estimation, the best proof for God's existence? Oh wow! Yeah. 
<laughs> that's true for God's existence. Well, so that's a great question. So I think the easiest way if I, if, if discussing is someone who doesn't believe in God is to just forego the whole beyond being stuff, because as we've been discussing, that's quite a headache in of itself, right? That's not going to, right? That's really kind of a, you know, discussion amongst believers, how exactly that works. But talking mm -hmm. to someone who doesn't believe, I would try to get them to admit that there's being, being mm -hmm. itself. Because which, as you know, you know, in a Thomistic uh, tradition, that's what God is, subsistent existence itself, uh, mm -hmm. ipsum essay. So how do you do that? Well, I would have, I would press them and say, well, any two objects in the room that you think they really exist, do they really exist? Or is that just your mind imposing this notion of existence upon them? In other words, is being objective, is being an objective property of the world? If they, if, and if they said, well, yes, I, 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 my mind isn't just doing that, there really is true objective being. And I would say between any being, so things as diverse as computers or thermostats or whatever it may be in the room, the books I see, right? So all of those diverse beings, they all really have being. And you really mean the same term being by all these different things. You really mean that they're, they all have being in the same way. And if they say yes, I say, well, then there must be something if you're saying this is objectively true and not just a product of your mind, that's the measure of that. That's the measure of being. Because you're saying that there's being as in the world, and it's not just part of my mind, all these different things really truly have being. Well, then you're already in the realm of transcendentals, I would point out to them, or platonic for forms if you prefer. You're already there because you're admitting that there is being. So any single being is going to show forth uh, being itself. And as, if they're willing to concede that there is being itself, then they've already conceded one of the classical definitions of God. Mm. Okay. Uh, this one is from Hercule. Is there any way to argue that with some, I'm sorry, any way to argue with someone that holds to the brain in a vat theory? Michael made a good point that no one lives like this. What do you think? Well, like I said, I'm really not a specialist in this. So yeah. um, I don't know if I have a good answer other than the brain in the vat theorists could just said, well, yeah, it's the guy attacked you. It's all happening like uh, if you've seen the movie The Matrix or something. It's happening mm -hmm. in a virtual world. It's not really happening in objective reality. It's happening artificially. Oh, or like I guess I like to bring it into that better because that's just some 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 demon or something, you know, tweaking your neurons. So you have all false perceptions. So really, you know, you thought this guy came and pushed you. That didn't happen. You thought he came and pushed someone. No, you didn't. You just mm -hmm. had all those sensations in your brain. So. Uh, but again, this isn't really my area of expertise, so I really don't have any any, would, any good responses. You know, I would ask that. Okay, the the world in which this brain is currently living in, <laughs> this brain in a vat, um, there's a reality there, and what we we need an explanation for that reality. So I, I think that we could still say that we could point to God from whatever that reality is, wherever that brain is is currently. Yeah, I agree. And, and the being argument I just gave would still work there because right. even if you're having illusions, you're still having being. The being could simply be the demon, you know, picking at your brain, but there's still some kind of being there. So as long as you have some kind of being, still a brain. You're going to get the argument off the ground. All right. Yeah. Uh, this one is from Indy Irish. Dr. Sengenis uh, was on the show claiming that the church uh, was capitulating on uh, geocentrism. I'm sorry, I misread this, claiming that the church capitulating on geocentrism was a turning point in history. Do you have an opinion on this debate, the geocentrism issue? Oh, that is a great question. I'm really not familiar with his work. Uh, the only argument for geocentrism I'm familiar with is by um, Dr. Wolfgang Smith. He argues it's actually a, a white hole at the, uh, I forget, it's been a while since I've, I've read his work, so I apologize. He basically posits there's a white hole and through the mathematics, that would make the Earth at the center. Mm -hmm. um, now, the white hole, at least in Smith's work, is, is neither verifiable nor disprovable. So it's just math that may or may not have, be there physically. Um, but I really am not familiar enough with the arguments for, for geocentrism that, that are made there. I'm only familiar, like I said, with um, Smith's arguments for it. Uh, pistachios 22 
uh, asks Nicholas, who is your favorite Catholic scientist? Oh, that, that's a great question. Oh, man. My favorite Catholic scientist. I'm going to... Oh, no, he was Lutheran. Oh, I thought I had one. No, but he's actually Lutheran. Dang it. Wolfgang Smith was a pretty good one there. He is. He is, is really good. No, no, yeah. no. He is, he is really good. I guess... <laughs> I want to say maybe Gassendi. Maybe Gass yeah, that's really a tough question. Part see the problem is anyone I pick, I immediately think of, oh, here's some problems with that. So uh, but my, my first instinct was, you know, maybe maybe Descartes. It's like, well, I don't really like his, you know, right. dualism. <laughs> he did a lot of interesting work, but he was really maybe too hardcore in the mechanical side. His mathematics is amazing. So sure, I, I I I go back and forth. So off the top of my head, uh and Galileo, obviously, that's problematic for a variety mm -hmm. of reasons, mm -hmm. right? Right. But um, so I, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess for the short answer, I have to say Descartes, though, with again huge like asterisks that right. you know I don't agree <laughs> with, with qualifications. Philosophy. Right. I don't really agree yeah. with Cartesianism at all, right. but his contributions to science are amazing. However, problematic they may be at times, like his magnetic theories and his whole, you know. Uh, neurological theories and whatnot. Emmanuel asks, how can one defend metaphysics from Kant who thinks it is a science? Uh, it, it, as a science, is knowable to the human intellect. And if it is a science, it leads to the antinomies of reason. I'm sorry. So you, you kind of cut out for me. I heard a big buzz. Can you? So yeah. I heard Kant yeah. and then buzz and then. Yeah. How can you defend phenomenal, phenomenal distinction? Yeah, how, how can you defend metaphysics from Kant, who thinks it's a science, uh, as a science that it is unknowable to the human intellect? And if it were a science, it would lead to the antinomies of reason. Yeah, so um, a, a couple of things. Uh, one, one is that, again, metaphysics is simply what is real. So even Kant presupposes something that is real. I, I, I think Kant, when he's critiquing that, it has a much more narrow target in mind than how I'm defining metaphysics, which is what is real. Because even Kant thinks things are real. That's I mean, the whole uh, numeral phenomenal distinction assumes that something is real. Not everything is just all part of the mind. As much, And even if he wants to break it down and say, no, you know, it breaks down the structures of the mind, he's presupposing the mind is real. So there has to be a point in which you're going to say something is real. And as soon as you do that, um, you're going to have metaphysics. Like I said, now, like I said, Kant's critique, I think, works in limited case cases. I don't think it debunks metaphysics entirely. Uh, last one here from Lucas. The West usually uses Aquinas' five ways. What are some Eastern arguments for the existence of God? Oh, that's a great question. That's a fantastic question. Um, yeah, they're really, they are, I know, oh man, I know Gregor Paulus has, has one. They're really, I, to be honest, I don't think there are that many. Um, I, I think for the reason simply being that because they had, uh, I would argue at least, a strong Neoplatonic tradition, once you grant that there are forms or transcendentals, you're going to have God as the measure of being. So I think kind of the argument I, I gave to Eric before, I don't know if it's really written down anywhere in any actual text that you could find, but I think it's very clearly the implication of even Plato's own writings, like in the Sophist. So I think the implication is there. If you want an explicit argument, uh, Plotinus definitely has several, right? He has one from some Simplicity. He has the one that I gave about how being presupposes unity and any being that you find presupposes unity, which is the one, which is the measure of being, uh, you'll find that there. Um, um, I want to say, again, I'm thinking like Max is the confessor whose feast day is today. You know, he, he has his ideas of how beauty draws us, eros, divine eros draws us in. But again, is that really a proof for God? P probably not, but it does make a whole lot of sense to reality when you start thinking in that way so that's a great question i would, I would have to do more research honestly i don't know if i can answer that pretty well off the top of my head no that, that was good the, they're always challenging <laughs> the, the yeah. live chat questions yeah. <laughs> i've been in the hot seat before too i know <laughs> what it's like <laughs> sometimes i'll just do a, a live stream you know 
and and just they'll throw out questions and uh we'll do a stump the apologist and they just throw out anything or you know i'll just do a solo live stream and they're asking questions and yeah they they can get challenging <laughs> yeah but those are those are good answers um i think that will do it for today but i really want to have you on again so that we can maybe talk more about uh eastern orthodoxy the essence and energies distinction yeah. our favorite topic here yes. um i think that would be really really fun that would be fun uh so if if you're willing maybe we can uh hash out a date off the air and uh, sure. have you back on and that'd be great yeah yeah. All right. Well, Hey, uh, Eric, did you have any uh, concluding comments or, or questions before we go? No, I, I enjoyed my time. I learned a lot. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. Again, we'll talk off the air. Everyone, thank you for watching. Please comment, like, subscribe, share this on your social media. We're trying to get the, uh, the show out there. So please share it as much as you can. Again, thank you all for watching. God bless.